when unrestricted free agency opened up, Montreal Canadiens fans threw out a lot of names out there on their wish list, one of which was Patrice Bergeron. You can remove his name from that list, obviously, because he resigned with the Boston Bruins on a one-year deal earlier today. Was Bergeron and the Montreal Canadiens ever a possibility, even slightly, even remotely? One guy who got down to the bottom of it is Jimmy Murphy of Montreal Hockey Now, Boston Hockey Now. He joins me to talk Habs, to talk Bruins on the Sick Podcast. I'm Marinero. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast. With Tony Marinero. The Sickest Montreal Canadiens Podcast. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadiens win the Stanley Cup. Sports entertainment like no other. Brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. And Lacage. If the last time you went to Lacage was when the Habs won the Cup, it's time you went back to Lacage. The menu will surprise you. Marinero, the sick podcast brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. The beer for those who follow their instinct and live their passions in order to make their mark like our next guest, Jimmy Murphy. And Lacage. If the last time you went to Lacage was when the Habs had a 50-goal score, it's time you go back to Lacage. The menu will surprise you. I was at La Cache, the Villa Sal location, as a matter of fact, last night at around uh, 8 p.m. or so. Had myself a nice burger and wings with the all-dressed baked potato. And my son Marco had the triple A steak, aged about 40-plus days. What a beauty. He loved it. Speaking of beauties, Jimmy Murphy, Montreal Hockey Now, Boston Hockey Now. What's going on? Not much, Tony. How's the summer going? Uh, it's, it's going to not much, a lot going on here today. Actually. Yeah, well, it's it's going fantastic for me because I've been on an extended vacation, right? I haven't really I've been working part time since uh, since uh, what uh, the end of May, which is kind of kind of cool, which probably going about three times a week with the podcast. I uh, haven't had to do any radio, so it's kind of cool. Very, very good. Nice. And uh, I went to La Romana. I enjoyed about eight days. There it was supposed to be nine. But my flight was canceled the night before I left. But that's another story for another day. So for me, it's going great. For you, today, August 8th, <laughs> it's going busy. Yeah, yeah. It was a free agent frenzy for the Boston Bruins today. Uh, well, they had Patrice Bergeron, then David Krejci, and then uh, they avoid arbitration and sign Pavel Zaka. So uh, they're pr- looking pretty good up the middle. And let's not forget, they, they've already got two other centers as well. So something's going to give, but we can get to that later. The big story, obviously, is Bergeron, but I'm really intrigued by Zaka because Me too. here's a guy that comes at the right age and the right size with the right experience that he goes UFA at the end of the year if they can't sign him and lock him up. Here's a player who I think has an untapped potential and a ceiling that's higher than what it is right now. There's a chance that this player could end up being quite a find. I, I, I think so, too. Look, Tony, I talked to uh, – I'm going to write about it either tomorrow or the next day, whenever I get the time. Um, I spoke to Mark Recchi, who was an assistant coach uh, for the Devils for a bit there for a few yeah. years, and he, he coached him, and he spoke highly of him. He said, look, I think, you know, uh, uh, I'll be blunt. He can be soft at times. Uh, he needs to have a little more of a mean streak to him. Uh, but other than that, I mean, the skill is through the roof. I mean, you know, if, th- if this kid can get it together – be a little more physical, drive to the net a little more. Uh, Recky thinks that, you know, the Bruins might have got a steal here. And, of course, you know, they traded Eric Holler there. They freed up a bit of money, but now obviously taking that money back on, uh, giving 3.5 to Zaka in this contract. But I, I think it's a great move by the Bruins, and you make a great point there too that he is signed a one-year deal, so he's going to be a UFA at the end of this contract now. And that's a lot of incentive for a player, obviously, who I think a lot of people are maybe – Looking at, I don't know if bust is is the word that might be too strong at this point, but he's approaching bust status. And I I think he's going to look at this as a nice chance to prove himself. He's going to get to play with some great veterans in in Bergeron and Krejci, and he knows Krejci well from uh, their international play for the Czech Republic. Uh, So we could see a little check line there. I'm thinking if they decide to move Zaka to the wing to start things off, you could have 
uh, Zaka, Krejci, and Pasternak together. Um, wow. But Recky, Recky spoke pretty highly of him, and he, he likes the kid. He said he's a great kid in the dress room. Yeah. And the other thing, too, that I think is good is uh, we learned when he signed here that he's actually been coming here and living here in the summer because his girlfriend is from Boston, and he's been practicing a lot with Charlie Coyle, uh, plays in a pickup league around here. You know, those they, they do the same thing I know up in the West Island there, and, uh, you know, a bunch of pro guys around here get together and play. So he knows the area well. He understands the – the fan base, and he's pretty excited. It's pretty cool uh, because um, the 2015 draft year, uh, <laughs> that's that's the year where the Boston Bruins had picked 13, 14, and 15. Remember that? Obviously, Jacobs Borrell, Jake DeBrusque, and Zachary Sinitian. But that was, um, that was a really good draft, eh? Mm -hmm. Connor McDavid won. Eichel, two. Um, Strom went three, Dylan Strom. Mitch Marner went four, Noah Hannafin five. Devils get Zach at six. Provorov goes in that draft. Wierenski goes in that draft. Meyer goes in that draft. Rantanen goes in that draft. A couple of picks uh, later, Denis Gurianov goes in that draft. After the Bruins had their three picks, of course, Matthew Barzal went to the Islanders. Kyle Connor went to Winnipeg. Ottawa had Thomas Shabbat. It's funny, eh? Imagine the Bruins at 13, 14, 15 would have drafted Barzal, Connor, and Shabbat instead yeah. of drafting Zboril, the Brusque, and Sinitian. Well, what's uh, ironic, to too, is remember Zboril was, uh, was Shabbat's D partner. Yeah. Team, you know, so it's like, how did you not know how good he was if you were scouting Zboril so much? Yeah. So, that's a sore spot for Don Sweeney. And I don't think he's ever going to live down. And honestly, I'm surprised that he he's still the GM of the Boston Bruins and that they re-upped with him. But he's got a good relationship with Cam Neely, who has a good relationship with the Jacobs. So uh, I think he's kind of got a free pass, unfortunately, for Bruins fans. Unfortunately for Bruins fans. Man, you make it sound like they have the worst GM in the league. He's not the not worst bad. GM. Eh. I think I think that, you know, it's it's hard to live down what he what he missed on in that draft there. I think you look at where the Bruins would be if they had the three guys you just mentioned – or even some other guys that went after that, Brock Besser, uh, some other players. There's so many players that I think could have been better than, say, a Sinitian or a DeBrus. DeBrus has been so Eric Sinek went later in that draft. Yeah. Anthony Bovier yeah. went later in that draft. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I think would have set them up nicely for the future. And instead, now here we are, what, seven years later, and, and Don Sweeney thinks it's 2011 again. So yeah, uh, I, I think that's the problem right now is that this team is just sort of Stuck and going to be stuck in that that purgatory of mediocrity that so many teams do find themselves in in the cap era. So by um, bringing back Bergeron, bringing back Krejci, it's had some people kind of crack a few jokes that the Bruins got older. Hey, listen, uh, I would bring back Patrice Bergeron any day of the week and twice on Sundays. Mm -hmm. This guy's still got some real good hockey left in him. But I, I guess it's they're going all in, huh? Yeah, they're going all in. It, it, but the problem is, right, Tony, look at their, their cap situation now. They're over now after the Zaka contract. Uh, they do have a buyout window that just opened up again for them. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe a, a Felino gets bought out or somebody like that. Uh, but I think, you know, we're probably going to see a trade soon. But still, they're going to be right tight against the cap uh, for the majority of the season. And so if you're going all in, you kind of needed that cushion to really go all in. I, I, I think they're... You know, I think they're somewhere in that six to nine, six to ten spot there in the Eastern Conference. Uh, I mean, the Atlantic Division. I think Ottawa's going to challenge for a playoff spot now, so it's not going to be easy for them to just get back to the playoffs, let alone make a run. I'm with you. I would sign Bergeron no matter what, and we were just talking off air. I would have given him five, six, seven million because he's Patrice Bergeron. He's a Hall of Famer. He's, yeah. he's won another Silky. Uh, he, he he was unbelievable last year. Uh, I would have given him whatever he wanted, but I don't know about the Krejci thing. I mean, I, look, I think David Krejci had a wonderful career with the Bruins, but I think it was time when he left before. And now he's been a year away from the NHL. I'm very interested to see how long it takes in the beginning of the season for him to adapt back to this game over here in North America and in the NHL and the speed of the game. Because let's face it, he's been getting slower as the years go on. Still a very smart player, though. But a very smart play, and that's that's how he comes. And, and I would think it's like riding a bike. Yeah, I, I'm I'm skeptical, Tony. I just I think this team right now, and you look at 
one thing everyone's not talking about right now is, okay, that's great. They got these guys back. They locked up Zaka. But guess what? They're without Charlie McAvoy and Brad Marchand, likely until American Thanksgiving at least. They're without Matt Grizzlick to the beginning of November. So, you know, those are some big losses there. The, the guys like Bergeron and Krejci are going to be dependent on to compensate for that. Does Krejci have it in him still to do that, to be, to really be that second line center? So it's going to be interesting to see how they get through those first two months. That's the way I see it. Um, I think they're going to make the playoffs. But once they make the playoffs, if they do, once they make it, how far can they go? And for me, if you don't have another cup in you, you're better off starting the rebuilding process earlier rather than later. I'm exactly. I've always thought that way. And by the way, a lot of Pittsburgh Penguins fans don't agree with me because they got Crosby and Malkin and they brought them back and they brought back Latang. Um, it's hard to say it's a mistake when it's Sidney Crosby, but let's just say you wanted Crosby to retire a Penguin because a player like that has to start his career and end it with the same team like Bergeron with the Bruins. I think you keep one, but I think the other ones, I think you're better off rebuilding. Now you can always make a case that it's unfair to that player in particular who's staying if you're going to rebuild. And that's probably what happened in Pittsburgh. They probably thought if Sid's going to retire here, we owe it to Sid to keep on trying. And if Bergeron is going to retire here, we owe it to Bergeron to keep on trying. It's probably what happened. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And look, I get it. I'm not in their shoes. And it's a lot easier said than done. What you and I are saying is the right path. And that's to even just start a retool. But, you know, I get it. It's tough. It's when you've got these guys right in front of you and you feel they can still contribute and you feel they've got one more run in them. It's it's a lot harder to say, nope, we have to be responsible here and move towards the future. And given what we were talking about, about the misses on that draft, and I think there's been some misses since then. Uh, in other drafts uh, and given the lack of first round picks that they've had since then, because they're always trying to compete and make a big deal at the deadline. It's going to be a while before the Bruins really can do a rebuild. They don't have much in their system right now to start that with. So I think they look at it like, all right, screw it. Let's go for it one more time. And that, and that's what they're doing. They're going to be pretty deep at center though. eh? They're going to have Patrick Bergeron. They're going to have David Krejci. They're going to have Charlie Coyle. Uh, They got, uh, they got Zaka. And I think they got no sec. Yep. I mean, they got they got five very capable centermen. Leads me to believe that one, maybe two, might be on the wing. Right. Or one gets moved. I mean, I could see I could see a no sec get moved. He's he's had a reasonable cap hit. He's a look. I actually was pretty impressed with him last year. I mean, this guy's not going to rack up the points, but he's very versatile. No. He can go in in some clutch situations for you and a, a contending team uh that needs some of those guys that can come off the bench and and fill in some key roles when guys are hurt or aren't playing as well he's a guy i'd be attracted to on the trade market so maybe he gets knocked out but yeah if not one of these guys is going to go to the wing i could see that doing it the bruins were probably hoping that he had a no sec for the net but uh (laughs) (laughs) but um, let's stop it here (laughs) okay we're not gonna stop it here all right listen where's the tip jar what um (laughs) What, why did it take Bergeron so long here? What happened? Well, you know, from what he told us, he just really wanted to, to reevaluate it uh, and, and think about things uh, with his family. But he did say towards the end of his Zoom call with the media today that actually he notified Don Sweeney prior to free agency beginning on July 13th. So Sweeney and the Bruins did head into free agency knowing that they had Bergeron. Then it just became a matter of the numbers, the bonuses, working out all those details uh, and just making sure that it helped the team still compete and that he didn't, you know, he didn't eat up a lot of cap space there, forcing them to maybe move some other guys that could hurt their chances at making a playoff run. But, you know, make no mistake, man, him and Krejci, uh, they they took a huge discount uh, for their yeah. team. And, and, and that's what leaders do, and I respect it. Um, the Bruins are pretty lucky to have that. Look, When Carey Price signed this deal, and I bring him up only because I'm out of Montreal, right? And that's one of the biggest contracts the Canadians have signed in franchise history. $10.5 million over eight years, an $84 million deal, a no movement clause. When he signed it at the time, he did not take a discount. I mean, if he got a lot of money, Mm -hmm. still today, goalies don't make that much. Who's to... 
who's to say what would have happened if he would have taken less like Bergeron did? They probably would have been able to add a player. And a couple of years ago, when they went to the final, if they have one more impact player, a player making $4 million, if he's making six and a half, probably closer to a club, a cup, you probably, you know, I don't, I don't think they would have won the cup with a $4 million player versus Tampa, but you know, I think it's very commendable what Bergeron is doing here. I mean, I think, I think it's awesome leaving money on the table so that they can try and, you know, fit everyone in and, you know, maximize what they can with the dollar spent, man, so much respect for this player. Yeah, a ton. And look, I, I admire him. He's, he's easily, you know, the best person that I've ever covered in this game in 21 years of covering the NHL, he's the best person that I've had to deal with on and off the ice. Uh, but, you know, I look at the Carey Price analogy there. Where was Carey Price at that point in his career versus where Patrice Bergeron is now? Or even where Patrice Bergeron was when he signed his previous contract. Had he You're right. Him. You're right. He had already right. won his cup. Uh, Price hadn't won his cup. No. He's a young kid. It's That's his chance. He may never get that chance. He could blow out his knee uh, the next day, and he may never get the chance to make that money again. And, you know, he ended up having some really horrible yeah. injury issues. So I, I don't I don't fault Carey Price or any other player who takes the big bucks or who commands it if if neither, they neither do I I don't fault them either and 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 by the way he wasn't thirty six years old either I think he was like thirty at the time right. or thirty one when he signed the deal or whatever it was so you're right there are different stages of their career he was a lot younger Carey Price was he hadn't won a cup yet Patrice Bergeron had but you know. Sidney Crosby, too, when he won that Stanley Cup and he signed the long-term deal, yeah. he settled at $8.7 million on average, knowing that he could have got more, but he wanted to try and win more Cups. Yeah, and I'm with you. But, you know, you look right now, too, and not that Bergeron and, and Krejci are going to affect this by any means because we're talking about next year. But I think the elephant in the room now for the, for the Boston Bruins is David Pasenak. And, you know, you had mentioned a tweet I had last week about how I don't fault players for wanting this money. And that's what it, it, it originated from was, you know, people saying, well, if Patrice Bergeron is taking this discount and David Krejci is taking this discount right now, then Pasenak should play for four to five million a year. No, no, he shouldn't. He's 24. He's earned it. The going yeah. rate is what the going rate is at that time in his career. He needs to take what he can get right now. Now, if he takes that, and, you know, down the line in his career, he's still a Boston Bruin or he's with another team and he's gone on to win a cup and that team still has a chance to win another cup. And they come to him and say, hey, in your next contract, can you take a hit for us? I understand that, but not right now. I don't blame no. Pasternak at all. And, and I'm telling you, he deserves 10 to 11 million a year for eight years would be what I would be offering if I was the Boston Bruins. Because if not, he's going to get it if they have to deal him somewhere else. Well, you take a look at some of the contracts that are out there and, and a lot of people are making money uh, and they put up less numbers than him. Look, he's in the prime of his career. Uh, he should be paid the big bucks and he's worth mm -hmm. it. It was the same thing for former sports radio hosts or podcasters when they're in the prime of their career. If you give them no budget to work with, you can't bring on any guests, uh, but they still have all the ratings and, you know, the highest I, I think they should be paid a lot of money. Yes. Show me the money. Show, Show me, me the, the money. money. Show me the money. <laughs> Show me the money. <laughs> All right. Uh, was there ever a chance? All kidding aside. Was there was there ever a chance between Bergeron and the Canadians? Because I know I think you asked him about it. eh? Yeah, I did. And he said no. He said, look, he goes, it wasn't that I, I wouldn't necessarily I would have been upset or anything, but I think you know, Kent Hughes, his former agent, now the GM of the Canadians, he just knew. I mean, he, they, they worked together for 20 years. And like Bergeron said, he understood that if I was going to play again, it was going to be with the Boston Bruins. That's where my heart is. It's either there or it's with my family or both. Um, and I think Kent Hughes understood that now. And Jimmy, it worked out in the end, too, because yeah, make no mistake, the Canadians want to rebuild and they couldn't rebuild with Patrice Bergeron. Exactly. I think he'd be good for the kids, but right now it's just not the direction you want to go. You want to be giving the kids that playing time uh, as opposed to bringing in a 36-year-old veteran. Uh, but look, he didn't rule out that he might play another year. So, I doubt it. I doubt it, Jimmy. Right. But all I'm saying is if, if, he, if he were, I don't think the Bruins are going all in again. They don't do it this year. That's it. They have no choice but to kind of move on. 
maybe, but I, it, yeah, it's slim to none that's ever going to happen. Yeah. Plus, I, don't know, forget, Tony, he hated the Canadians growing up. Don't ever forget that. I, yeah, I know, of course, he grew up a uh, Quebec Nordiques fan <laughs> from Austria yeah. Lorette, but look, he wouldn't be the first player who signed a bunch of one year deals near the end of his career. Yeah. Um, uh, but in, in his true. case, I just, are you like me? I just doubt it. I just, I get the I'm feeling that this one could be the last one. Here's a player that has a lot of mileage in him, has suffered some pretty significant injuries too. I remember the year that they went to the cup final. There was a punctured lung among, among other things. I think he yeah. suffered a couple of concussions. He's, he's been beat up quite a bit. He, he's, he's something else, Tony. I mean, I, you know, I said, he's one of the best people I've ever, he's one of the toughest guys I've ever covered. He too. Yeah. I mean, Tony, I remember that was the 2013 Stanley Cup final that you're referencing there. First the Blackhawks, right? Exactly. And he yeah. played two games with a punctured lung, uh, three broken ribs, and a dislocated shoulder. I stopped playing soccer at 17 and a half because I didn't grow toenails. <laughs> so, hey, by the uh, way, I've said this story before. They actually had to pull them out with like pliers. Okay. Oh, I've been, I've been there, pliers. my friend. It's not fun. It, it, right? It's a very painful okay. experience. Now, you know what you're supposed to do to cure them. For the most part, you know what they say, right? You you take a, um, uh, you know, a, a basket or whatever you want to call it, a, a, whatever, and you fill it with water, a pail, so fill it with water, right? whatever. And, um, and um, Javel actually is something that they recommend. Really? Okay. But I went to see a specialist back in the day, and you know what he told me? What? He said, you want to cure these as fast as possible, and you'll never have ingrown toenails again, and your nails, your next nails will grow back perfectly, and you'll never, ever suffer from this ever again. And I said, yeah. And he said, pee on them in the shower. <laughs> and I said, are you serious with me? And he said, every time you need to pee, go in the shower and pee on your toes. And Jimmy, I got the best toenails in the world right now. Uh, the best. You're, you're a pisser, buddy. Hey, listen, <laughs> I just told you something you didn't know, did you? No, you're right. You're Never right. I didn't grow toenails again. Yeah. Pee on them. Yeah. As we, as we say in Boston, you're wicked pisser, Tony. Wicked hey. pisser. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, what else is the um, what else is going on in uh, in Boston? You're a host of Montreal Hockey Now, Boston Hockey Now. You report yeah. on both clubs. I don't know how that happened, but I think it's kind of yeah. cool. It's it's right? interesting, man. It gives yeah. you time to spend time in Boston and to spend time in Montreal, of course. And uh, I, I guess, um, with the exception of a couple of injuries that you just talked about to start the season, most of the storylines have fallen into place today, huh? Yeah, they really have. I mean, I think the one thing we have left, right, is what we said, that somebody get bought out or moved uh, to get back to cap compliancy. Uh, but other than that, yeah, they, they looked. Don Sweeney just said, all right, I'm going to do this all in one day, and he did it. So good for him to uh, you know, bang that out now and not let it trickle into training camp. I, I just think now you start to look at, okay, the lines and, and what are they going to do while those guys are out? How, how do the lines and deep pairings shape up? But uh, – that, you know, they're set. They're pretty set, except for that one move we said that has to fall what they just did today. We'll see where that goes. Uh, one thing I, I, I'm interested in now, though, is Jim Montgomery. And I, I think I like this hire. I didn't like how they handled Bruce Cassidy. Uh, after learning of some things that I learned, I understand why the move was made. I just didn't like the fashion in which it was made. I mean, they let him go out. Hold on, Hold on a second. Hold on a second here. Yes. Hold on a second here. You're not going to tell me after learning what I learned and that not and then not tell me what you learned. Okay. I'm gonna tell you. So here's what here's what I learned. Okay. Okay. Tell me. Is that um, for whatever reason I I don't know I I was told he had he had kind of improved and matured or evolved so to speak where he knew how to handle younger players and handle veteran players as well and, and had learned, you know, he, his first stint in Washington, Tony, and I remember having this conversation with him before he became a coach again. He was a scout for a while, and a couple of times I would sit next to him up in the press box, got to know him a bit, and we would just talk, and, you know, I asked him what happened in Washington way back, 
Uh, and he said, look, I walked into a locker room. Uh, you know, he had Yaramir Yager in there. Uh, I'm not sure if Bondra was still playing that much. But he had, there's a lot of big name veterans that were in that locker room when he became coach of the Capitals. He didn't know how to handle it. He, he actually used these words to me. I'll never forget. He said, I was awestruck, Murph. And I, I didn't know how to handle the players. And sometimes I let my emotions get the best of me. Sometimes I didn't use enough emotion. But when he came here, he seemed to have found that that balance, that happy medium. And by all accounts, had good relationships with the players. But apparently over the last year, um, he had started to ride some guys pretty bad, uh, whether it be in practice or in games, on the bench, was uh, verbally abusive to them in front of the teammates. Uh, and, and it got to a point where Bergeron actually had to step in and say, hey, man, I don't know who the player was. I was not told who it was, but Bergeron stepped in and said, look, enough's enough, man. You got to stop humiliating him the way you're humiliating him in practice and on the bench. It's just not right. And it's not healthy. No, you don't do that stuff anymore. Like you, you used to do it before. It didn't make it's it right. But you just, we've all evolved and you don't just, you don't do it anymore. Yeah. And so it got to a point, I think when they did the player exit interviews that a lot of that came out. Um, but here's I'm my surprised question. to hear this, by the way, not surprised that, I'm I'm surprised that it happened because he comes across as he's very modern, modern day, yep. very smooth and a great communicator. I'm not surprised you're telling me this because his firing, I think, was. It didn't make sense unless something happened and you got the feeling that something happened or else it just wouldn't have happened. You know what I mean? So yes. I'm not surprised you're telling me this, but I'm surprised that it actually went down this way. Well, you know, in, in the way it went down, and I'll get to that, it was very interesting. It's like that he has his exit interview, and from what I'm told, he's to he's flat out told, we're bringing you back. There's some things we need to correct. We'll work on it. Uh, we'll figure it out, but we're bringing you back. A week later, he's given permission to reassemble the, uh, his coaching staff. Uh, he had been butting heads with Kevin Dean, uh, who ran the defense uh for the Bruins for the last five years, him and Dean actually known each other. They worked together in Providence as well. They've been working together off and on for about 12 years. Uh, but apparently that relationship had run its course. And so he, he went right to Don Sweeney and said, I, I think it's time I move on from Kevin and I, I want to let him go. And we're going to, I have some guys in mind that we can bring in. He got Don Sweeney's blessing to do that. And they did it. And then two weeks later he was fired. So that's, that's right there where I get the, it's like, what the, what the heck is that? How do you tell a guy to fire a coach, uh, assemble a new staff, and then fire him? Well, the only thing that makes sense in there, that scenario is. <clears throat> um, Maybe they learned well, more in those two weeks, huh? One of the players probably didn't take a liking to the dismissal of Dean and said, why'd you get rid of him? And Or you probably got rid of the wrong guy. Or maybe Dean ended up saying a thing or two on his way out. Who knows? Who you knows? Know. I One know it didn't come, man. I know nothing came from me, and I know nothing came from you. You know. Yeah, well, I will say this, Tony. I like your hat, by the way. Very nice. Thank you, my friend. I, I will yeah. say, for a fact, I know this. Don Sweeney did not want to do that firing. He did not want to deliver that news. He did not want to fire Bruce Cassidy. So what I am led to believe, if it came from Cam Neely, is that, you, like you said, maybe a player or Kevin Dean, what have you, did an end around. Maybe they went to Don Sweeney and said, you know, we think he needs to go. And Sweeney said no, because him and Cassidy were very tight. They were really on the same page. And so this came from above. And that's interesting to me going forward. Is oh. Don Sweeney just got overruled by Cam Neely. Uh, so surprise, surprise. You're right. And then, but then they signed Sweeney to three years. I mean, so yeah, Sweeney but he has to know that he's he's not the end all be all GM here. It's well, Cam but, Neely. well, I mean, Cam Neely has been, you know, the president of the Boston Bruins yeah. for quite some time, but he's been Cam Neely's like this. He's been unofficially their coach, their assistant coach, their GM and their assistant mm -hmm. GM ever since he's been there. I mean, he runs the show, right? He's the, he's yeah. the, you know, the trusted one. Well, you, by, know, you know, the Julian story, right? When Julian, the year they won the cup, well, he was going to be out if he wasn't going to win that game versus the well, Canadians. He was almost out in Montreal in December that year. You can go back and you go back and watch the game. And actually, I think that's the game that started the whole Pacioretty 
Char a feud. Pat Pacioretty said something or did something to Char. And that. But anyhow, the Bruins blew a lead in that game and lost in yes, overtime. Yes, the Canadians won in overtime. Pacioretty actually right scored. Right around Christmas, right? Pacioretty scored, and he nudged Chara from behind, and then there was a little mm -hmm. scuffle that ensued and stuff like that, which carried over to the next game, which led a lot of people to believe that Zdeno Chara did, you know, hit exactly. Matt Pacioretty into the stanchion on purpose, which if I were a betting man, I would say yes. But you would likely say I, no. I have confirmed with more than three people that were associated with that team at the time, a player, a management member, and an assistant coach, that after that game, this this, this goes to what I'm going to tell you now. The next day, I'm driving home from Montreal. Yeah. I've been up there covering it. And I get a call from my editor at ESPN Boston. He says, you got to pull over. Cam Neely just went off on Claude Julien on the radio. He did a weekly spot on a local FM channel, WAF at the time. They're gone now. And he said, you know, I'm getting sick and tired of having a coach who doesn't understand that if you don't score, you can't win. The object of the game isn't just to keep the puck out, it's to score goals. And he just kept taking shot after shot at him. And so, you know, I, I went, I wrote the story. I just did it verbatim what he said. It was just a strictly report, no opinion, yeah, no insight. Yeah. And the next day, I, I got called in to the office by Cam Neely. PR guy, Matt Shimura, came down and said, Cam wants to talk to you. And Cam told me he didn't appreciate it. And I said, well, what didn't you appreciate? I just wrote what you said. He said, well, I didn't like the way it was implied. I, go, can't, I can't control how your words are implied if I'm just strictly writing the words you said. Of course. And that, and that was that. And he said, whatever. Okay. And that was it. So... You then look to what happened, like you referenced it there, that series against the Canadians. If they don't win that game seven uh, or, or that series, he's gone. And apparently this feud carried on through the year up until that series. And after they won that series, somebody told me that Claude Julian went up, you know, after the media had gone home and everybody was just kind of hanging out and he was having a couple beers with the assistants and Cam was up in his office and he went up and stormed into the office and he goes, fire me right bleeping now, Cam. I dare you. Fire me right now. And that was oh. it. And just looked at him. So. Wow. After winning the cup? Yeah. No, no. This was after the, the Montreal oh. series. Oh, and then they launched the, the cup. After so I'm going to tell you a story about that series. Um, game seven, as you know, between the Canadians and the Bruins was in Boston. What a game. And uh, the Bruins were up by a score of three to two. And P.K. Subban ties it up with about 90 seconds to go in the game or whatever it was. Right? Yep. It was a rocket that Tim oh. Thomas kind of ducked and it went like right under the crossbar, right? And um, the Canadians, you know, you, you go into overtime after, and now the Canadians have the momentum because they scored with a minute and a half left in the game or whatever, right? At the end of regulation, Cam Neely is walking down press box row. I'm sitting down. He's got smoke coming out of his ears. <laughs> He is red in the face like you cannot believe. Yep. And he ended up smacking like there's a pillar. There's a wall there in press box row, I believe. Yep. I know exactly I what you're talking about. I felt the floor shake. <laughs> I'm like, this is not a joke. Like he yeah. slapped the pillar, yep. which was about 10 feet away from me or whatever it was. And I can feel the whole press box row shake. I said, and it looked like he was going down to the locker room. Yeah. Like it looked like he was going down. Like he was, cause there's yeah. an elevator there. Right. And it looked like he was taking the elevator, go down. With it. I said to myself, if the Bruins lose this game over here, it's going to get ugly. Like it's oh, just yeah. going to be. Yeah. And um, they were going to blow it up. You know, luckily for them, they didn't lose. And, you know, Claude Julien, the Boston Bruins go on to win the Stanley cup. Yep. So one of the worst, one, the of the worst one of the worst days of my life. <laughs> that was a hell of a series, man. What a crazy series, eh? Vancouver yeah. wins every single game on home ice. The Bruins win every single game on home ice. You go back. Can I tell you something? When they went back to Vancouver, uh -huh. like I just had this sickening, the, the, this sick feeling, sick, not in a good way, not like the sick podcast, which is great, but sick in a bad way. I had this feeling the Bruins were going to win because what's the chances of losing every single game on the, like you're probably going to win one right now. I know like the home team has advantage, especially in game seven, more often than not the team that plays at home wins, 
but I just had a feeling that the the, the Canucks were going to choke in Game Seven, and I don't want to say they did because choke's a big word, but I mean that game was a no contest. Was it four nothing? Yeah, yeah. It's funny you bring that up. You know, Recky told me once we were talking about that, just kind of off the record stuff, and he and he he said, "Look, we knew, we knew in Game Six that we were going back there and winning because we could see it in their eyes that they didn't know what the hell hit them. That they they said." They looked in that game, Vancouver, going into game six, and they, they were saying, we don't want to go back. If we if well, there's a game seven, we're in trouble. Because the Bruins used to smash them at home. When they used to play oh, in Boston, gosh. I think they, they put seven or eight by Longo or whatever it was. Yeah, right? I don't think there was a goal differential less than three. I, I don't have it right in front of me, but wow. they, I think it was three goals or more every game the Bruins won by. Uh, they just dominated them in Boston. It was two different series. It's funny. We were we, this past year when the Bruins uh, lost to Carolina, it was following the same path. People kept bringing up, oh, it's 2011. So maybe the Bruins can steal game seven down in Carolina. I said, this isn't the 2011 Bruins. Well, apparently I was wrong. Here they are again. Uh, <laughs> shout out to matrixofitness.ca. Those Bruins players are going to want to be in shape because they're getting a little bit older. And of course, you can discover a club quality workout at home. Uh, by bringing it home in the comfort of your own home, visit matrixhomefitness.ca for all of their cardio equipment, whether it's a treadmill, elliptical, bike, rower, you name it, you got it. All right, Montreal Canadiens, in ending, I never had a chance to talk to you about the Slavkovsky pick and what the Canadians did in the offseason. So are you surprised they drafted Slavkovsky? I was surprised, but then that surprise went right away when they went out and made the deal for Kirby Doc. Uh, yeah. You know, that meant okay. We, lo- we we have switched over. We like Slavkovsky a lot, and now we have somebody to come in, a young player still, kind of a similar situation to Zaka. I'm not putting him on that level, but just, yeah. you know, has a lot to prove still. He's still young. 21-year-old, Un- former third round, third pick yeah. overall in the draft, pardon me, third so, pick overall. Well, there you go. You know, and I, I, think it was a, I think it was a great draft weekend for the Montreal Canadiens. I loved a lot of their picks. Uh, I'm going to murder the pronunciation of his name. Hudson? Hudson? Lane Hudson. Lane Hudson. I like that kid. Saw a lot of highlights from camp there and then went and checked out some video on him. Reminds me a lot of Tori Krug. Uh, I love the two first round picks, obviously, Slavkovsky and Massar, uh, who I actually wrote about today for Montreal Hockey Now. I think those guys, once they get to play together in Montreal, they've already got some chemistry. They're good friends. Uh, I like what Kent Hughes is doing, man. I, I have loved pretty much everything Jeff Gordon and Kent Hughes have done. Of course, they, they're two I Boston did. boys. That's yeah, why they, they, are, right? yeah, I know. they were living down the street from each other. They even have country places at Cape Cod, whatever. Yeah, and, I like the vision, though, Tony. I do yeah, like the vision. So do I. You know, and, and, they're, and they're not afraid of the market, which is huge. I, I, yeah. I think that, yeah, you say, yeah, they're two Boston boys getting thrown into – the toughest hockey market in the world, in my eyes. I love uh, them too, Jimmy. Media. I do. I just, I, I've had a good feeling about them since day just, one. Jeff Gordon seems like the very, um, like he doesn't panic. He seems very analytical. Uh, Kent Hughes is, is just as great people person, great communicator. His experience in the agency business, I think serves him well with the relationships yes. with the players yes. and stuff like that. I, I think they're developing, they're putting together a, you know, a pretty good organ. Look, I'm going to tell you this. I think this duo of Gordon and Hughes, I'm going to put mm-hmm. myself out there. I might be wrong. I think in their tenure with the Canadians, and I don't know how long it's going to last. I think they're going to deliver a Stanley cup. I believe. I that. do too. And I think the, 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 I'll say, let's make it a trio. I think Martin St. Louis is going to be part of that as well. I, I just, I love that hire. I like what he's doing. I like the I'm, way I'm he- not willing to go that far because as much as I love Marty, uh, it's a lot easier for a GM or a vice president of hockey mm-hmm. ops to last eight, nine, 10 years than it is a coach. Right. Correct. Yeah. So but we'll see. I'll tell you what, I thought it, one of the coolest moments of the draft was yeah. when Marty took the stage. I mean, just the reaction yeah. he got the way he, the way he, you know, and Hughes is the yeah. same way. But the way he can command a presence and, and talk with the crowud or talk with the reporters, yeah. I, I, it's they've needed that for a long time, right? You, I you thought didn't it have was... that open line of communication. You didn't have yeah. sort of that back and forth relationship. Yeah. And I, I think that's refreshing up there in Montreal right now. Yeah, I thought it was one of the n- next best things after the sick team had their draft party at Lacage. And how'd that go, by the way? 
It went great. It went nice. Out, it went out. Listen, nice. thanks for doing this. I hope to see you uh, sometime soon in Montreal. I'll and, be up there uh, in September. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll meet up, all right? Maybe all right. We'll, meet, we'll meet up in September. We will. Thanks again. Okay, Have buddy. a good one. All Have right. Good you can follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, and Twitter at The Sick Podcast. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tell all your friends about it. It's absolutely free to subscribe. I'm Marinaro, The Sick Podcast. <laughs> And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow The Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by 8.6, Intense by Nature, and Lakage. If the last time you went to Lakage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to Lakage. The menu will surprise you. <laughs>